Excelente. So they're your colony? Yeah, because one you're getting overtaken by the Tishwans and all kinds of Oh, you have to. Do so, you have um, any kind of crop or anything? And so I. Um, He's ready for you. Oh, all right. Do you have the IHMA agenda? Yeah. I haven't got the chance to print it out. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, let me see if I can do that. Yeah, sure, sure. No problem. I'm, I'm just, if you don't, I'm going to go home all afternoon. Yeah, you can make copies here. And I can make that brief announcement. I don't know if I can do that. Well, good morning. And um, this is Bob Signore, and I'd like to welcome you. Welcome back from the summer break, the first of three fall meetings, sessions of the Illinois Homeopathic Medical Association, joint meetings with the Academy of Veterinary Homeopathy for the joint study group meetings. So it's great to be back. Unfortunately, I have some very sad news. Um, I was just told that our dear friend and esteemed colleague, Dr. Joel Shepard, has recently passed away. Oh, geez. So please let's all bow our heads in a moment of silence in, um, in memory of our esteemed colleague, Dr. Joel Shepard. All right, well, we have two really, really good um, speakers today. And uh, first I would like to, um, Introduce our first esteemed colleague is Dr. Mitchell Fleischer. He's double board certified. He's a family physician. He practices um, integrative medicine, and his focus is on uh, anti aging medicine and also health optimization. His practice is in Afton, Virginia. And today, uh, Dr. Fleischer will be speaking on integrating homeopathy, peptide therapy, and nutritional medicine to effectively treat serious skin disease. So I'm really looking forward to this lecture. So please welcome Dr. Fleischer. Thank you very much. Hope you guys are all good on this beautiful Saturday morning. It's gorgeous here in Afton today. I'm sorry to be inside. I wish I could be giving this lecture outside. You could see the beautiful leaves and mountains around me. In any case, yeah, we're gonna be talking about how to use an innovative approach to treat some serious skin disease. And I'm gonna give you a presentation on a pretty amazing case that presented to me and um, all the different things I did integrated to help this gentleman. And then we'll have plenty of time for a Q&A thereafter, okay? All right, so you gotta, you gotta let me start, machine. there we go. All right, so this is a cured case study presented to illustrate how to integrate homeopathy, peptide therapy, and nutritional medicine in serious pathology. And this is a case of a very painful bilateral chronic dermatitis, thromophobitis, and persistent cellulitis of the lower limbs. It began after an episode of spontaneous bilateral deep vein thrombosis, and there was no history of trauma, infection, or, or other known pathology. The patient was a 54-year-old Caucasian male, IRS agent, who came for an integrative medical therapy after failing several courses of heparin, and Coumadin was his warfarin, uh, Epiquis, which, and these are uh, paradoxic. These are these synthetic, the new anticoagulants that are pretty dangerous drugs because they're irreversibly um, uh, anticoagulants. So if you're on one of these things, you get hit in the head, you could bleed to death in your brain. Xeralto, and he was also given lots of um, broad spectrum antibiotics, both IV and orally. As Conventional doctors were unable to control the progressive disease process with conventional modalities. And they were discussing 
performing bilateral lower limb amputations due to the persistent severe thrombophobitis with a high risk of recurrent deep brain gonfosis and potential pulmonary emboli, stroke, and death. And the patient informed me that he angrily refused this option. Actually, I'm leaving out all the expletives he used. He was really pissed, <laughs> which gave me a clue into his remedy type right off the bat. The initial physical examination revealed very warm erythematous violaceous, which means purple, uh, severe dermatitis and emphysema of the lower limbs from the knees at the inferior patella margins all the way down to the ankles. Bilaterally, that was extremely tender to the slightest palpation. In fact, just my hand approaching his leg, he would wince mm -hmm. from the expected pain. Um, standing and abulation were very painful. In fact, he, he, he tried to walk on his tiptoes. It, it was so painful. Uh, his cardiopulmonary and neurological examinations in fact, all the entire russet examination was normal. Um, there was nothing else going on except what I saw in his legs. And this is what it initially looked like. Uh, and this is the, uh, this went all the way up below, to below the knees. And it was, um, the diameter uh, the, uh, of, was about five times the normal diameter of his legs. That's how edematous and swollen it was. And you could feel the heat emanating off of the, the limbs. His family history was remarkable for recurrent blood clots, DVTs in his father and maternal, uncle, paternal uncles. Uh, there was pulmonary emboli in a brother, and uh, two of his maternal uncles had strokes under the age of 60 years old. Anatomical, pathophysiological um, of the of examination of both, of the presentation of both low limbs showed severe chronic venous stasis dermatitis, really bad. Uh, diffuse inflammatory microangiopathy of the capillaries and venules, microembolic obstruction of the small and the medium sized venules diffusely in both limbs below the knees, and resulting lymphatic congestion and edema. There was also regional hypoxia and cellulitis, and the hypoxia is what results in the violations of purpleless deceleration. Initial laboratory evaluation showed a SED rate of 60, which is twice normal, so showing a lot of inflammation. His CRP cardiac, which is a measure of inflammation of the vasculature, heart and vascular, was markedly elevated, 78.4, normal is less than three. His ASO titer, which is a measure of inflammation of the body, was very elevated, five times normal, 1,043. And I also got a coagulation uh, a factor profile and his factor eight was greatly elevated, 274. The ANA I looked for uh, autoimmunity was negative, and there were no fat. There was no evidence of any autoimmune uh, factors. And all of his other labs were basically unremarkable. Interestingly, no coagulation factors testing was previously performed, despite suspicious family history. And this was at major medical universities. I don't know why they never thought of this. So. My initial therapeutic intervention was uh, with an agent called astaxanthol. This is a potent broad spectrum lipophilic or very fat loving anti inflammatory polyphenolic complex. And it contains three different lipophilic agents that are powerfully anti inflammatory um, to start decreasing the, uh, the, the great inflammation and swelling of the tissues and decrease pain. I also put them on different agents to decrease the clotting in a system. And when you get blood clots, the, the, the blood clots are pr predominantly f uh, due to fibrin formation. We have a liquid protein floating around in our bloodstream called fibrinogen. And when there's a, an area of injury, either in the lining of the blood vessels, the intima, or you have an injury in the lining of the skin, fibrinogen uh, is cleaved into fibrin, which is a cobweb-like protein that forms the protein matrix of the of the clot. And those can be cleaved and broken down by fibrinolytic agents. One of the best is uh, an extract of soy, natto, which is like uh, fermented soy cheese. And this is, and you want to have one that limits the amount of vitamin K because so vitamin K opposes the anticoagulative process. So NSK Mega is a, a vitamin K free natto kinase. And natto, natto is the name of the, of the fermented soy, and kinase is the, uh, uh, the term for an enzyme that cuts. A kinase is one that cuts. 
I also put them on another form of a fibrinolytic agent called Plasminex, which is Bacillopeptidase F. Also put them on a broad spectrum uh, of protease enzyme called Inflamase. Uh, and this is several different kinds of uh, protease enzymes with catalase and, and uh, super, superoxide dismutase. And also a, uh, a fourth kind uh, called uh, syrup Seripidopeptidase. This is actually from silkworms, and this is how they break down the fibers to, to create silk. I also put them on some uh, peptides, KPV cream, which I'll discuss what KPV is later. We were using that, applying that to the both legs three times a day. Also put them on immunomodulatory agents to help support his immune system's control of the inflammation infection. Thymosin alpha-1 is one of the best. I'll describe that later too. Thymosin beta-4 is another thymic peptide that works with alpha-1 uh, alpha to uh, decrease the amount of sclerosis and inflammation. And to discuss the protease enzymes, what, they're, what they are and what they do, a protease enzyme is an enzyme that catalyzes, at, at, catalyzes proteolysis, that is the breakdown of proteins into smaller peptides or single amino acids. And they do this by cleaving the peptide bonds within proteins by hydrolysis. They have potent anti-inflammatory, anti-fibrinolytic, and anti-thrombotic properties. I've treated many different kinds of um, thrombotic conditions, uh, pulmonary emboli, uh, uh, clots in, uh, uh, after people have uh, coronary bypass, or they have um, uh, stents put in and they develop clots. I, I use the protease enzymes very effectively to clean all the clotting out of the vessels. It works better than all of the allopathic agents that really don't work on fibrin at all. And they're also used very effectively in surgical wound and burn debridement without damaging the healthy tissues. Uh, you probably heard of bromelain used for this purpose. And bromelain is, it actually is from the root of the pineapple. And it's just one of many protease enzymes. And it's actually one of the enzymes that's in the inflamase. And these are different references that you can refer to to study more about the protease enzymes, because I found them to be extremely useful agents in my clinical practice for, for reducing inflammation, not just from uh, clots or, or, or thrombosis, but also from inflammation from a musculoskeletal injury, uh, for inflammation in the sinuses and the lungs. Like I use it in post-COVID patients who are still having a lot of uh, a, a bronchi, bronchiectasis or, 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 or bronchial inflammation it works very well in any sort of inflammatory condition of the body and clears out the inflammatory proteinaceous debris. And this is an introduction to peptide therapy, what they really are. These are an effective, safe natural medicine that are just remarkable. And peptide therapy is an evolving cutting edge of medical science in which specific bioidentical protein amino acid sequences called peptides are used to repair, regenerate, support, and improve the structure and function of different parts of the mind and body. And well-known examples occurring naturally as human peptides are insulin. Insulin is the most famous of all peptide hormones. ACTH, which is a adrenocorticotropic hormone. Glucagon, which opposes the action of insulin. Growth hormone or somatotrophin. And thyroid hormone, but there's bunches of others. There's over 7,000 known peptides that are naturally occurring in the human body that have that, that thus far been identified immoral all the time. And there's over... There's actually over 200 medicinal peptides that are currently in clinical practice, although the FDA is trying to uh, ban them, take them away from the peptide industry and us peptide doctors and give them to big pharma. We're fighting them now legally about this nonsense. Or just as an aside, they, they, the FDA recently banned 24 different peptides, claiming that they all had, um, this, is their, this is their excuse, they get the same excuse for every single one. They said there was potential allergenicity. And while the lawyers and the, doc and the researchers in the peptide industry did a worldwide literature search of tens of millions of doses and millions of patients worldwide, couldn't find a single case that of allergic reactivity or anaphylaxis or death from peptides. It was all bullshit, excuse my language. They're just trying to take it away from the peptide industry and give it to Big Pharma, like they did some agglutide other agents, and put their own garbage into it to make them toxic and then increase the price for several thousand percent. But we're not going to let them get away with it. Peptide therapy is becoming more popular with integrative medicine physicians because 
some basic reasons. It's highly specific and very effective in their clinical act, uh, therapeutic action. They're very safe and extremely well tolerated when prescribed correctly. And it's very important to understand the difference between pharmaceutical drugs and medicinal peptides. With conventional allopathic pharmaceutical drugs, the mind-body complex will always have a reaction that's unfor unfortunately often includes some pesting, potentially harmful and sometimes lethal adverse side effects. You know, for example, uh, there's this drug called Humira, one of the biologics. Did you know one of the main initial symptoms of Humira is sudden death? Why would anybody take such a drug, right? This is due to the fact that pharmaceutical drugs are foreign molecules, unfamiliar to the body, that biochemically force changes, bio metabolic and biochemical changes, and distortions upon the mind-body complex to which it often reacts badly. Whereas in contrast, peptide therapy is bioidentical human medicinal peptides, and the mind-body complex will always have a response a response that is very safe and virtually free of any adverse side effects when properly prescribed by a well-trained physician who understands and is certified in peptide therapy. This is due to the fact that medicinal peptides are messenger molecules with which your mind and body are already familiar because you were born with them and you make them all the time. For example, there's a peptide produced in the lining of your stomach called BPC-137, body protection compound, and it's responsible for controlling inflammation and injury to the entire lining of a GI tract from your mouth to your anus and works phenomenally well for gastritis, esophagitis, celiac disease, um, uh, GERD, all forms of inflammatory bowel disease, phenomenal stuff. And these, essentially, these peptides are in essence natural communication molecules, human communication molecules. And the cells in your mind-body complex use the innate inborn medicinal peptides to communicate with one another and tell what them to do and what not to do. That is, they guide and balance all the metabolic and regenerative functions that serve to keep us healthy. And when they're properly prescribed and administered by a special trained physician who understands them, medicinal peptides communicate with specific cells, tissues, and vital organs of the body by binding to peptide receptors on the cell surfaces, thereby signaling optimal cellular messages for health improvement and potentially enhancing and optimizing the function of the entire mind-body complex. And this is what I've found of the several years of practicing with them. Pep uh, benefits of peptide therapy can include increased energy and stamina, better mental uh, focus and memory, because there's specific neuropeptides that do this, uh, strengthened immune system defenses, like the thymic peptides, one's produced from the thymus gland. There's over 200 peptides produced in the thymus gland, four of which are the most important, uh, thymus and alpha-1, thymus and beta-4, thymulin, thymogen. Uh, and there's improved recovery from illnesses and wounds, increased muscle mass and tone, increased bone density, so you can use for osteopenia osteoporosis, Greatly improved skin elasticity. Uh, one of the best is called GHKCU for this fact. It's a tripeptide that's wonderful for healing the skin and also reducing wrinkled skin. In fact, GHKCU is the main ingredient to most of the very high-end expensive cosmetics from people like Maybelline, where they, 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 they charge women 500 bucks for like a half ounce of this stuff, where you can get the GHKCU in purified form for <laughs> from peptide pharmacies for far less money. It's also been shown to help uh, create fuller hair, Decreased body fat and weight loss. You've probably heard of Ozempic. Well, that was originally semaglutide from the peptide industry, and it works better, much better from peptide pharmacies. It also helps uh, lipid uh, profiles, increases, uh, decreases uh, joint pain and muscle pain, and, and re deeper regenerative sleep. There's special peptides that improve the sleep-wake cycle. And, of course, everybody wants enhanced libido. It's good for anti-aging and regeneration of the entire body. Uh, it's excellent for tissue repair of bones, cartilage, ligaments, tendons, joints, muscles, and skin. It helps balance endocrine hormones, the sex steroids, and, and even the protein endocrine hormones. It enhances growth hormone production. There's special uh, pep, or rather than giving growth hormone directly, we now know that there are, the human body, different cells and tissues produce growth hormone releasing hormones and growth hormone releasing peptides that help stimulate the pituitary gland, the anterior pituitary, to release growth hormone in a more no normal physiologic dose and pattern. That's much more effective. Uh, also for hair growth and, and restoration, we know that things like thymus and beta-4 
uh, GHKCU and other agents are very helpful. And if you still have some hair follicles, it'll help that. It's fantastic for both acute and chronic inflammatory diseases of all sorts, uh, especially arthritis, uh, both degenerative and rheumatoid or autoimmune. Uh, all kinds of autoimmune disorders. I have several cases of lupus erythematosus and multiple sclerosis that are doing fantastic on uh, peptides. Also helpful for mood and, and memory enhancement. One, one that helps regenerate neurons is called dihexa, uh, seventh, uh, 10 to the seventh times stronger than our own innate uh, human peptide, BNMF, which is brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It will also help uh, increase cellular energy production and enhance vitality. Uh, cytoprotection protection from oxidative stress of all sorts. Also effective in Alzheimer's and use of dementia. Excellent for post-stroke recovery. I have several patients who regained most of their uh, pre-stroke function after several months of peptides. Very good for obesity and weight control. Uh, there are several peptides in the streams. So they're called the GLP-1 RA receptors or, or the glucagon-like receptor agonists. You have semaglutide, terzepatide, rusepatide. There's several different kinds that are available now. With uh, Some of the new forms are without side effects, and they're really excellent for not only burning fat, but also for decreasing atherosclerosis, uh, 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 helping glycemic control, and also act as neuropeptides. In fact, semaglutide, the, the first one, was actually developed for as a dementia drug, but they, in the research, they happened to discover that it was also an incredible uh, glycemic control agent. Uh, works on osteopenia and osteoporosis, along with supplements. You use the peptides along with basic minerals and, and proteins, and, and that works beautifully together. Uh, Anti-anxiety uh, anti and uh, anti-stress disorders. There's uh, some peptides like Ceylon or Cmax that work wonderful for that, uh, for depression as well, along uh, along with uh, agents that support the production of serotonin and dopamine. Uh, for example, the tryptophan and 5-hydroxytryptophan and tyrosine, good for us insomnia. There's one called Decip uh, uh, that works wonderful on insomnia, uh, also improving sexual uh, function and erectile dysfunction. One of the best peptides I've found uh, to use for the skin and anti-inflammation is called KPV. KPV is a potent anti-inflammatory peptide that's been shown promise in a number of disease conditions. And this, uh, the most active research is in the treatment of inflammatory bowel disease when the peptide has shown incredible promise. I use a combination, an oral combination of BPC-137 and KPV to control uh, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis and it works remarkably well. Uh, it's been shown in animal studies to be safe and effective when administered orally, intravenously, subcutaneously, and topically. Uh, and it's also been shown to work well in wound healing. And it's actually, KPV is actually a portion of a, a very powerful peptide produced in the brain in the pituitary gland called alpha-MSH, melanocyte stimulating hormone. Alpha-MSH is actually the main hormone that controls the immune system in the gut, the Peyer's patches in, in the large bowel, um, where mo that's where 170% of serotonin is and the majority of our immune system is. And it speeds wound healing, reduces infection, fights inflammation, and it leads to better cosmetic controls because it's anti-sclerotic. It's used with uh, uh, KPV and similar peptides are mainstays in wound healing, but particularly in scar reduction because it's, uh, it's uh, anti-sclerotic effects. It helps to reorganize uh, fibroblasts so it lay down collagen elastin fibers more effectively in a more organized pattern. Thymus and alpha-1, uh, this was first discovered in 1972, was isolated from the thymus gland. You know, this is a gland that's in little kids up into uh, toddler age and young adults. Uh, and it shrink, it involutes as we get older, so we have less of this being produced. Um, and this is an aput a potent immunomodulator, and it helps to balance the functions of the innate and adaptive immune system, so, so cellular and humular immunity. Uh, enhance, again, it enhances cellular immune, immune defenses against infections, against malignant cells, and helps regulate the inflammatory process. I give thymus and alpha-1 to all of my patients who have autoimmune disease and have malignancies, and it really helps their immune system um, uh, seek out and destroy the cancer cells. It stimulates uh, dendritic cell function, which is what the cell that communicates between the pathogen and the uh, white blood cells. Uh, it's been studied for the treatment of cystic fibrosis, TB, CMV, where all kinds of respiratory disorders. I have a patient with 
chronic cirrhosis of her hepatitis and alcoholism. That's their uh, liver fibrosis is healing from it. And also, again, as I mentioned, cancer. Thymus and beta-4 is another thymic peptide derived from the thymus gland. And it's been shown to improve angiogenesis or new blood vessel growth to regulate wound healing by stimulating fibroblastic uh, activity and organization, by decreasing inflammation, and also reducing oxidative damage in the heart and central nervous system as well as other, or, other organs and tissues. Uh, it plays a, a, a role in cellular protection and tissue repair, regeneration, and remodeling of injured or damaged tissues. It's also of active interest in anti-aging because it decreases fibrosis in a lot of places in the body. So at the four-week follow-up consultation, he said that his pain was reduced by about 30%. The erythema and lymphedema was reduced about by 20%, which is reasonable, given that nothing else was working for him. And his regimen was modified at that point to uh, also include PPS, pentasan polysulfate. I gave him a, a, a superficial IM injection in, the, in his legs above the cellulitis every two weeks. And I did that in the office. And then he was scheduled to come in for his constitutional homeopathic consult in two weeks. Pentasan is a semi-synthetic polysulfated xylan. It's a form of hemicellulose polypolymer. Uh, and it has potent anti-inflammatory effects on the skin, mucosa, muscles, joint, and joint tissues. And it also has uh, anticoagulant properties. And in fact, uh, it, 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 it's been shown to also help the body dissolve clots. It's been used, it's one of the most popular drugs for treating interstitial cystitis, which is a very painful bladder syndrome, uh, and also for arthritis, because it's been shown to, uh, when you give, um, uh, this is in the oral form, if you give it an oral form, uh, it works very well for cystitis. Uh, but for arthritis, when you take it orally long term or by twice a week um, subcutaneous or intramuscular injections, it's been shown to actually promote uh, the growth of chondrocytes and chondroblasts and increase cartilage production. And the longer you take it, the healthier the cartilage becomes. I give that to a lot of my patients with osteoarthritis and it's really helpful. So it's it also is given orally and by subcutaneous and intramuscular injection. And at the date of the homeopathic consultation, his pain was reduced by about 40%. His erythema and lipidema were reduced by about 20%, 25%. And his constitutional mental emotional symptoms uh, were significant. They were noted to be very rapid speech. It was extremely loquacious, jumping from subject to subject. I mean, the, you couldn't slow the guy down. In fact, he was very anxiously restless. And most people just sit in my office. He was he he got up and he was pacing back and forth as he was talking to me, talking a mile a minute. He was also very suspicious and censorious in his demeanor. I noted that because. He repeatedly referred to his other doctors and what he, what he thought about them and what he liked to do to them. <laughs> and he also didn't want to take any medicines. He hates medicines. His physical symptoms, including that he generally felt worse in warm, wet weather. He felt worse after sleep, like he slept into his symptoms. And he'd wake up in the morning, feel worse than he when he went to bed. The, there was inflammation in the skin and tossed to the shifts of the lower limbs. Uh, there was pain on palpation of the lower limbs. Uh, there was painful swelling of the lower limbs, and there was a bluish, purplish, or violaceous discoloration of the in, of the different flame tissues. He also mentioned by taking a whole case that his teeth felt too big; they felt too long, uh, which is a very peculiar symptom because they didn't look longer. They looked actually they actually were fairly small teeth, <laughs> you know, most people. And he said his teeth hurt when he brushed them. So I repetize the symptom. This is a rhetorical analysis. You can see I, I'm looking for the totality of symptoms, and here's mind loquacity. Mind loquacity changing quickly from subject to subject. It's a four, which is the highest. This goes from zero to four, four being the mo its most representative. He had uh, restless nervousness, suspiciousness, soyous critical demeanor, aversion to taking drugs. He was generally worse in, in warm, sultry weather worse in damp weather. He was generally worse after sleep or sleeping into his symptoms. The, it had the elongated sensation of his teeth, uh, toothache worse from brushing his teeth, inflammation of the lower limbs, the lower limbs uh, 
pain being worse from touch, uh, a purplish discoloration, swelling, bluish swelling, edema and swelling of the lower limbs, and painful swelling. And you can see that the remedy Lachesis mutis covered the totality of the symptoms. Okay. And just to give you a bar graph, that's how strong this representation was compared to all the other remedies. So that when I see this analysis, that kind of gives you a clue that I think you're on the right track. So the initial homeopathic prescription, I gave him Lachesis mutis 12C in liquid potency. I had I dissolved, had him dissolve 10 pellets in a one ounce dropper bottle. Um, and he stirred, he, he took two drops and he put that into four ounces of water, stirred that 30 times and took a half teaspoon daily. And of course, Lachesis mutis is the preparation of the, of the venom of the South American uh, Bushmaster snake. And what's interesting, it contains an array of potent fibrinolytic and hemolytic toxins, hyaluronidases, methaloproteinases, which these are enzymes that eat through soft tissue, uh, phospholipases that do the same thing, and bradykinin and potentiating peptides. The bradykinin and potentiating peptides are what cause pain because they activate the P fibers in your skin and soft tissue. And the subsequent prescriptions, uh, the homeopathic potency was gradually increased every few weeks according to his clinical response. First from 12C to 30C to 200C, then to 1M, then to 1LM4, and finally to a 10M potency. And the doses were always diluted in water to enhance the therapeutic efficacy. This is based on the sixth um, uh, version of, of the organon, uh, where Hahnemann found that liquid potencies were far more effective. And this is the appearance of his lower limbs at, at four week follow up. You can see there's less scaling and less, somewhat less edema and somewhat less erythema. This is the appearance at the six week follow up. Much less edema, the scaling is less, and you're starting to be able to see his toes. This is the appearance at eight weeks. You can see here's the margin right on top. You can see the, the legs above. Uh, uh, about three, four centimeters above the malleolus, it was really beginning to completely clear, and he only had this distal um, cellulitis left. This is the appearance at 10 weeks follow-up. The appearance at 12 weeks. The appearance at 14 weeks follow-up on the regimen. And this is the appearance at 16 week follow up. Virtually completely back to normal. So the patient report at the 16 week follow up the lower limbs are now completely free of pain, swelling, heat, discoloration, and scaly skin eruption. He's able to stand and walk normally, which he was not able to do. He's now able to exercise, which he wasn't able to do for many, many months. His quality of sleep greatly improved, which is a typical response to lachesis. And he's more tolerant of warm, damp weather, uh, improvement in his physical general symptom. His teeth now felt normal length and were painless on brushing, which I wow. thought was very curious. I, 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 I'm trying to teach this to dentists. <laughs> and uh, he feels calmer and less nervous and restless, although he's still very talkative, although, he's, although it's less pressured speech and he actually was sitting still at my desk and talking to me and stayed on more than one subject. The follow-up labs showed that the, now that the sedimentation rate, the CRP cardiac and the esotida were all now with the normal limits. His factor rate was down to 124%, dramatically decreased. Uh, but given his family history, suggesting positive, possible inherited factor rate coagulopathy, um, I discussed with him, and he chose to continue the maintenance dose of astaxanthal, plasminex, and not a, uh, not an SK mega, um, on an ongoing basis to prevent any clot formation. On the long-term follow-up, the patient has been seen in follow-up every six months over three years, and there's been no recurrence of the severe life-threatening dermatitis and thrombophobitis, nor any clinical evidence of active coagulopathy. So. Thank you, and I'm happy to entertain any questions at this point. Uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Fleischer. Um, I, 
Uh, first, I'd just like to say that in dermatology, we would call patients like this elephantiasis. Um, for whatever reason, that name is still stuck and we still use it. Um, it's just a bear to treat. I mean, it takes months and months and months to treat with conventional things. And sometimes they go from institution to institution and sometimes they never get better. Um, so uh, I would have to say that your results are nothing short of miraculous. Yeah, it blew my mind too. And I think you know, if, <laughs> everything, yeah. in, you know, when you give a remedy, it's always a hypothesis, even if it's a, you know, really seems like a true similimum, every prescription we give is just a hypothesis. And you don't know that it's really the true remedy of the, uh, until you see the clinical results. Exactly. Uh, I mean, it was, it was a really good fit for lachesis. That's just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, Tim Fuhr has a question. Hey, Mitch. Um, yeah, uh, what do you think would have happened if you had started with uh, lachesis too, maybe with the other stuff? I know we don't want to do too many things at once, but I mean, it seems well, like had... from the beginning with the purple, when I see skin that's purple, I mean, yeah. Oh, I, I wanted to take his whole case though. I wanted, you know, I had I had never done a constitutional with him before. And right. I had been suggesting to him that, you know, we should do that, but he wanted to wait. So I did took the case when he was willing to come in for a whole case. And the peptide therapy you could prescribe more just based on the pathology. Yeah, exactly. The pathophysiology. And so uh was that it? So a glutide is a peptide. Yes, it is. It's it's one uh, of the main there's the, the the main GLP one RA um peptides. Uh, I think one of the first ones was liraglutide, which has to be taken every day. Semaglutide was the first one that could give, be given once a week, which certainly uh, allows for greater compliance. But there's many more that are coming out now that are actually even more effective than semaglutide with um um, greater effectiveness on lipolysis and weight loss. And also there's a new one that just came out that works phenomenally well for um, reducing hepatic steatosis or fatty liver syndrome. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, that's going to become clinically, clinically available sometime soon. So there's, there's, so much, there's a lot of progress being made in peptide therapy. It's a very exciting field. I mean, uh, the company Novo Nordisk that came up with the semaglutide, I mean, they're going to become the, probably the first trillion dollar drug company because of, just because of that drug. I mean, no, they're, they're, they're actually not the ones who developed it. The, the, the Big Pharma didn't develop the peptides. They were developed by peptide science, science researchers. Right. And then the, big, uh, big, big, big Pharma stole it from them. <laughs> right. Monetize it. Right, right. Now, uh, semaglutide, I mean, some of these peptides, you said bioidentical, but some of glutide is, is it naturally found in the body? Some of these, it sounds like some of these have been, you know, are, are analogs, but not exactly. It's, it's, it's very similar to uh, naturally occurring compounds. We, are, we do have GLP-1 RA um, uh, peptides in the human body, and these are um, uh, very, very similar to those. There's slight tweaks in them to make them slightly, um, slightly more potent and longer acting than the ones we naturally produce. And I imagine, I mean, if you tweak it and then you can patent it and then you can make a trillion dollars, right? Right. In general, if you use the natural substance, you can't patent it. Right. That's why I use both. Yeah. Interestingly, most of the most of the peptides produced by the peptide uh, uh, community uh, are they they haven't patented them. They've just released the information out to the world uh, for everyone else to use them. It's big pharma that wants to put their tweaks on it and uh, patent it. Right, that's their business model. That's what they always do. It's the patent. The patent is what determines profits. If you have a patent, right. you can have big profits if it's successful. Exactly. Mitch, are those are those tweaked um, peptides and and uh, Susan Beal, are mm -hmm. those tweaked peptides and stuff? Are, are they uh, genetically engineered? Or are they harvested from naturally occurring situations, and or are they in, you know, the the vat fermentation kind of situations? Actually, it's a it's a more interesting technology. Uh, uh, for the last 20, for the actual uh, last twenty thirty years, they've developed the technology to string together uh, amino acids, 
So what they do is they look at the, they analyze the sequence of a peptide, um, and you know some of them are you know you know simple peptides like uh, uh, GHKCU is a tripeptide. It's just three amino acids, very simple to make, and you have others that are much more complex. But they have they have the, the machinery now that actually you put the purified amino acids into one end and it just knits them together. So you have a completely bioidentical um, molecule from one end to the other. And it's not extracted from animals and it's not made from bacteria. It's just pure amino acids that they string together. Very interesting technology. It is, yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mitch, what's the cost of the, some of the peptides that you mentioned, the seropeptidase, the, I know natokinase, uh, NSK was one that used. What? How do they compare to? Uh, like we all know that semaglutide is expensive. Well, actually, a month the, or something. from the from the peptide from, from the peptide industry, it's much less expensive. When for when you buy uh, like Wagovia or Ozempic, it'll run you eight hundred to twelve hundred dollars a month. Right. When you get pure semaglutide from one of the peptide compounding pharmacies it runs around anywhere between 200 to 400 dollars um, a month and it's there's no other garbage in it whereas the when you take Zempic or govia one of the big pharma products it's in a fixed pen dose and you can only take that dose you can't adjust it right mm -hmm. whereas when you get the when you get the peptide from a compounding pharmacy it just comes in a three to five or 10 ml vial and you can adjust them out for example um i i always start um semaglutide, all these agents in a, a very low dose, uh, like a like 0 0.1 ml, a tenth of an ml, uh, just to see how sensitive is people are. Because, you know, you know, we know that people are all bioenergetically unique, and you can have 100 people with the same diagnosis as this gentleman, but they might need, you know, 100 different remedies based on the way they express their symptoms. But we're all biochemically unique too. So I find that I always start with the least amount of the substance, uh, uh, and see how sensitive someone is to it. And if they if they respond in a few weeks, great. If they don't, I slowly increase the dose from like 0 0.1 to 0 0.2, all the way up. So I, I'm the, the highest dose I've had anybody on is uh, 0 0.35. And at that dose, they started losing weight, whereas they were in the others, whereas other people, I keep them on a 0 0.1 and they do great. And that's one, a tenth of an amount once a week. And uh, that tends to be very cost effective. You know, I want to find what's the least amount of a medicine that will have a therapeutic effect, uh, so that it'd be most cost effective, and then you then you adjust according to their, cl their clinical response. The semaglutide, I think the dose is like half a mil. They, if you're doing it in the in the uh, ozempic form or the wagovi, it's like half a mil. Right? That's yeah, it's a much it's a much higher dose. They usually are yeah. around two point two point five milligrams, which is a lot more. Then uh, you really want to start. That's why a lot of people who take a Zempic or Wigovia at that higher dose tend to have side effects like GI effects, nausea, constipation, vomiting. They have a lot of bad side effects because you're hitting up too fast and you don't know who's the sensitive person. I find that when I start at the much lower doses that I'm allowed to by using from the peptide pharmacies, um, I can I can ratchet it up slowly depending on their clinical response and any side effect profile. And when you start low, their body acclimates to it better and you can gradually increase the dose and then they don't get those side effects. So that's why people uh, Ozempic are having gastroparesis and things exactly. like Exactly, because they're getting whacked all of a sudden and it's turning off their leptin and, and, and ghrelin and all the rest of it is messing up the system and, and their body's not ready for it because it's too high a dose too fast. But if you want to become a trillion dollar drug company, you can't let people individualize. Of, you of, of course, of, of course. <laughs> that's why we're trying, that's why the peptide industry lawyers are suing Big Pharma to prevent them from taking, you know, they made KPV and BPC and a whole range of other peptides, you know, basically banned them, made, took them away from us. Like the KPV cream, can't get anymore. I, the pharmacy I got it from, they said that they were they were basically threatened by the FDA that if you made KPV cream anymore, we'd come in with guns drawn and close down your pharmacy. They they are very heavy handed, just like the rest of the Biden administration and or Harris administration, and we're we're fighting them to make, get it back because they they tried to take some of glutide and the rest of them away from us and we fought them and we won, and hopefully when uh, 
the 47th president comes in, the, you know, the last thing he did as the 45th was the Right to Use Act, um, uh, which allowed people to, patients to be able to use a drug of any sort, even if it wasn't approved by the FDA, if there, if there was, you know, no evidence of harm, they could try it. One of the first things Biden is when he got in the office is he obliterated that, took it away. So when we have that back, people will be able to use these things again. And I think the pharmacies will be, have a more free range to be able to produce and, and make them available to us as Guinness practitioners. Very interesting. Hey, uh, Mitch, quick question. If anybody's yeah. interested, um, how did you get certified in peptide medicine? Where, where did you study it? And like, how long does it take? I mean, because you obviously know a lot about it, and how many years have you studied it so far? I've been studying it on my own for about a decade, and then um, uh, through A4M, the American College of Anti-Aging Medicine, they had a certification program, which I took. Um, that was a two-year program, a little over two year. I got that certification, and then um, there's the, the, the International Peptide Society uh, under Dr. Uh, William Seeds, I was a member of that, went to a lot of the, he had intensive weekend uh, s seminars and webinars. And I went to a, 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 a whole series of that over a two, three year period and got my fellowship in the SSRP, which is the um, SEEDS um, Scientific and um, Performance Society. And they're sort of like the top training program in the United States and possibly the world. Um, and uh, I've just continued to be part of studying and 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 exchanging with my colleague, other fellows and other doctors. They have a, a very good website um, when you become uh, when you've taken the you could take actually online courses through SSRP. So it's the SEED Scientific uh, Research and, and Performance Organization. Anybody can access it online, and um, you can either take the courses in person, which is really kind of fun interacting with your colleagues, or you can just do the webinars. They also have, uh, for the last several years, they have something called the uh, Peptide World Congress, uh, which meets in usually some very nice hotels. <laughs> and the, I mean, the last meeting we had in uh, Las Vegas um, at the Bellagio, there, there were like over 2,000 people in attendance and uh, more online. So more and more doctors, and this is not just the United States and Canada, it's worldwide people coming. And I've had the, I've had the pleasure to be able to present at three, three years in a row, um, cases, cured cases, and how do I use peptides and homeopathy and other things. So I'm, I'm trying to teach these other alternative doctors about how, how powerful homeopathy is along with peptides, putting bioenergetic and biochemical medicine together. And it's been very gratifying, but that's what I'd recommend. I, I'd recommend the, um, the SSRP courses. That's probably the best out there. Um, and it's a lot more cost effective than the um, A4M course. So yeah, there's some good resources there. The patient that you presented, Mitch, do you think, um, have you had a case similar to that with really bad uh, the phlebitis, cellulitis, uh, uh, this was one of the worst cases I, I'd seen of this, of this. Yeah, this is one of the first worst cases I've seen with this particular condition you know, that he was on the verge of getting bilateral uh, above the knee amputations, which I thought was outrageous. And he was on so much pain, you know, that we wanted to treat him right away. But I've had other, other kinds of cases of skin diseases. I'll give you an example. One case I had was a woman who presented to me, how many years ago is it now? Four, four and a half years ago. Uh, a woman presented to me with stage 3B uh, squamous carcinoma of the vulva. And um, that's, you know, it's a really, it, it, it starts off with a condition um, of looks like eczema, uh, a cross between eczema psoriasis of the entire vulva region. It's very painful and itchy and burning and uh, can sometimes be exudative. Um, and it penetrates into the tissues, unfortunately. And she'd had radiotherapy and chemotherapy and what surgery they could do. And basically it all failed and she was sent home to die at 50 years old. Can you imagine that? Mm -hmm. And so she came to me and um, I started on uh, peptides and, and uh, nutritionals. 
um, and a, a lot of stuff to uh, use top. I had a special cream made off of KPB, BBZ, and GSKCU. Actually applied TAD to the whole area of the vulva, and that calmed it down quite a bit. And then I gave her her constitutional remedy, which turned out to be calcarea sulfurica, alternating it with carcinosin of 58T, which is no, it's a cancer no so that has tons of different kinds of cancers in it. And, um, and then different uh, nutritional age supportive agents and thymosin alpha one and thymosin beta four. And by four and a half months, the, there was no evidence of any lesions in the vulva at all. They had completely cleared up. And by six months, we, uh, she, we sent her for a repeat uh, MRI scan, uh, CT and PET scan, and there was no evidence of disease. And I've been seeing, oh, she also, I also began her on a special anti-cancer regimen. There's, there's a, a really phenomenal approach to selecting precise nutraceuticals for someone's cancer. Because, you know, again, we're all bioenergetically unique. We're all biochemically and cellularly unique. And, you know, one of the, one of the big problems with conventional cancer therapy is, you know, they're treating the diagnosis, not the individual. They have someone who comes in for breast cancer or prostate cancer or lung cancer, what have you, and they have a set regimen. Uh, they throw those chemotherapy agents or, or, uh, or therapies at the patient, and the results are often not very good. And uh, there was a group of oncologists, uh, MD PhDs in Europe, who over two decades ago uh, decided, you know, this is really unsatisfactory not to know how to prescribe precisely what a given individual needs. They were actually almost thinking homeopathically without knowing it. And so they developed a, a very, very sophisticated elaborate technology where they uh, um, investigated the uh, cellular biochemistry and cellular genetics of the individual cancer cell. They would extract uh, the cells from the blood, the circulating tumor cells, and culture them, and then examine them very carefully, and then also once they understood the, the, the biochemistry and genetics, they would also test them against different agents. They tested them against a wide range of different kinds of conventional chemotherapy agents to find out what the cells were uniquely sensitive to. As it turns out, if there's a kill rate of over 80%, then that particular agent is what's actually effective. Um, but they also, interestingly, would were testing the circulating tumor cells cultures against natural agents like uh, curcuminoids, like curcumin turmeric, and artemisinin, or lipoic acid, or a pigenine, a, a wide range of things, and they'd find out how effective those were as cytotoxic agents or as a, a PK3 inhibitors or immunostimulants. And they found that several different of these agents were really highly effective. Like if, if they found that it was, because the, what they did with the, with the conventional agents, they would expose them daily for a whole six days. And at the end of six days, it was an 8% cure rate, that chemo agent was effective. With the natural agents, they exposed them once to that agent to see what the kill rate of, and it was over. If it was over five percent, they knew that it was an effective agent. So, for say, example, if you had your cells tested and vitamin C was twenty percent, that was extremely effective. So, I knew that person would respond to high dose IV vitamin C, and uh, I would, and, and they would give me a, a very elaborate analysis of all the different products that were effective. And then I would create a protocol based on that information and, also, and ch choose the most um, effective agents, the ones that, ones that are in the 15 to 35% range. And uh, then you could design a very individualized uh, a regimen for a given individual that was, for a given person, that was, that was most sensitive to their specific cancer cells. And that approach, uh, that I've been using my patients for several years has been the most effective. Rather than willy-nilly, oh, try some of this and try some of that, now I can precisely design a program that's shown to be an effective anti-carcinogenic, anti anti-tumorigenic approach with the appropriate uh, nutraceuticals. And that's been an extremely gratifying result in my patients. And this person is now four and a half, you know, like they're several, a couple of years out from their tumor and they still have no evidence of disease. What is and the name other, that set, where, where do you send out for that test? Uh, to, that, that, it, it, it's, it's called RGCC, 
uh, and it's in their their station their uh, their laboratory is in Greece. And what I do, uh, what's required, you have to understand their system. And this is pretty, it's pretty complex to analyze the, the reports when you get them back. So you go through about an eight month training uh, online and um, uh, so that you understand it and you get all kinds of testing to make sure you do understand it. Uh, and then you're, you're able to order tests. And when you get them back, you can understand what the heck they mean. And you can, you can interpret them and put them into clinical use. Um, so you can you can go to online and and, and uh, Google RGCC, and uh, they're actually having a, a clinical conference in Denver next month, which I'm attending and presenting some cases. And uh, this is the first time they've had a major conference in the United States. So it's good. There's not many doctors practicing this because it's a lot of work. But you know what? Homeopathy is a lot of work too, but it's also very gratifying because it works. And uh, so I, uh, that's how I prescribe the nutraceuticals for my cancer patients. It also works for uh, chronic Lyme disease, uh, for uh, long COVID or chronic COVID syndrome, for people who have chronic Epstein-Barr virus syndrome. They have, they have different protocols for those conditions as well. And it, this is RGCC was one of the pioneers in the development of um, what are called cancer vaccines. They actually are able to take your uh, the, your cancer cells and find out the genetic epitopes on the on the cell surface, and then to develop um, a monoclonal antibodies against that cancer cell, which and it, and those those vaccines only target the cancer cells and no other cell in the body. So they've been very effective. They also have dendritic cell vaccines where they uh, are able to extract and culture and 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 um, then concentrate the dendritic cells, which are the communication cells in your white blood cells, and uh, teach them how to attack the cancer cells. And you can give those vaccines as well. And I've used all of those and with to great effect. I have I have a uh, two stage four cancer patients, um, metast widely metastatic, who have done extremely well on the vaccines. But that requires a, a, a lot of training, but it's worth it. Are you familiar with uh, Medieri, uh, the, the place in uh, Ashland, Oregon, that uh, they do a lot of nutraceuticals for cancer? They kind of specialize in cancer. They have oncologists there that give nutraceuticals. I don't know what protocol they use, but I know they use a lot of lab testing, uh, neutro neutrophil to lymphocyte ratios, copper zinc ratios, things like that to determine progression, things like that. That stuff is, that stuff is helpful, but I found that it's not quite as detailed. Uh, mm -hmm. And as accurate as the RGCC laboratory. Do you think your patient would have responded? Because I mean, basically, the patient you presented, he basically cured with a combination of the peptides and the lachesis. Do you think he would have had that that much improvement with just using peptides or just using uh, uh, lachesis? You know what? That's that's a hypothesis. We'll never know. All I know is that. My main concern is primum non nostri, first do no harm. And also, I find that using a multifactorial integrative approach, uh, you know, I've been doing this for about 48 years now, and I've treated patients with just homeopathy, homeopathy nutrition, homeopathy peptides, and I find the combination of all of it together, you get a better result quicker. Yeah. I think most of us have found that you have to combine other things, nutrition, whatever, whatever. I mean, the, I mean basically, in, in, guys. Yeah, like, in, the, in, in, the, in, in the organ of medicine, Hahnemann says, you know, in the fourth aphorism, you know, basically get people into, you got to eat a healthy diet, you got to take them out of the basement, you got to get them in fresh air. So he already, he already alluded to uh, sort of naturopathic care in addition to homeopathy, which is essentially, you know, Peptide therapy is actually a form of naturopathic care because you're using human communication molecules. How much more natural could you get? And he, and, and he also wrote about removing, which is basically what you said, Mitch, is but removing the things that would give you false symptoms of disease and, and that right. then we can treat the naturally occurring disease, not all of this other confused stuff. Right, right. You know, and you know, it's wonderful that we have some of these nutraceutical agents available to us because I've treated a wide range of thromboembolic disorders with these enzymes, you know, learning, experimenting with over the years and finding out what works. 
and you know, they're just remarkable. One of the first cases I had many, many years ago, uh, this wealthy horsewoman who lives in, near me in North, um, Charlottesville, friend of one of my patients, um, injured uh, her left leg horseback riding and uh, developed a, a pretty bad thrombophobitis uh, with a PE. And she went to the top, um, the chief of hematology oncology at the University of Virginia, and he put her on plebdaxin, all the rest of this stuff, and she wasn't getting better. And her leg was swelling and she was miserable. And, and they were telling her she's gonna have to have a, um, uh, a surgery to remove the clot, all the rest of it. And her friend, which is a good friend of mine, who's experienced homeopathy, she sent her to me and uh, I put her on a remedy and I put her on a, 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 a wide range of these uh, protease enzymes. And uh, with it, within six weeks, the swelling and everything in the leg was down dramatically. We sent her for a, 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 you know, another ultrasound and the, the clot was gone and the clot in her lung was gone. <laughs> and she went to her, the, the Hemonc guy and his response was to be angry at her for going to a quack. <laughs> so I realized that, well, you know, maybe I'm not be able to not convince the big shots that this approach works. At least I know it does work in clinical practice. And I have lots of examples like that now over the years. Can I ask one sort of strange homeopathy philosophical question? I'm going to ask sure. it. Um, sure. If, unless we're time pressed. One of the things that I'm really, really curious about uh, with most of my patients over the last however many decades being not humans, but also, you know, some humans in there as well. The the thing that I find really, really interesting when we look at these lachesis cases is when we go back and look in veterinary medicine, um, painting with not a super, super broad brush, but lachesis is a really commonly used remedy in, in veterinary medicine, and it is particularly commonly used in animals who have received rabies vaccines. And, and you know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of work in the human literature saying, you know, listen as the specific and blah, blah, blah. But, but really, in veterinary medicine, what we see for not every single one, but, but for a lot of rabies vaccine responses or a whole bunch of clinical signs that that evolve after uh, rabies initially or boosters. Lachesis is a is a really powerful remedy medicine for that. And a yeah, lot of the question. symptoms that we see, you know, were some in this that you showed in this case. Uh, some of them, uh, you know, are all other things like like you know all the neural symptoms of lachesis and, and that sort of thing. So my curiosity always is. When we have human individuals who are showing symptoms that would get lumped into sort of those hydrophobia type rubrics or human patients who have had uh, curative or towards curative responses to lachesis, I am always, always curious is do those, do those humans have pets in their home and are the pets that are in their home vaccinated for rabies? And, oh. and I... I would love to somehow set up some sort of like just add a question to all of your, uh, you know, your anamnesis uh, questions and, and that, that sort of stuff. Because my gut has said for years, and I have some situations where, yeah, that's true. Uh, sometimes it's bite, you know, animal bites, but mostly it's not. It's more like, you know, they've got the affectionate, well vaccinated golden retriever that licks the baby sort of thing. Anyway, that's that's my question, and I wonder if any of the clinicians who treat humans have thought about that. Well, that's a question. I, I, I don't I don't you know that's a brilliant that's a brilliant idea. I, I, I was because I believe very much in uh, the effects of vaccinosis. And I mean, Compton Burnett was absolutely right, and I've treated a lot of uh, autism due to the MMR and even due to uh, yeah. a, a, a autistic like spectrum disorder from even the, from the DPT. Right. from the pertussis. And uh, so that's clearly a possibility. Um, this patient didn't have any animals. His wife wouldn't let him. <laughs> and he was too busy. <laughs> anyway, but that would be an interesting idea. But, you know, over the years, uh, many of my patients have actually... But did he as a child? Yeah, yeah. Many of my patients have consulted me to treat their animals because they didn't, uh, they didn't, have, they didn't know where to go. And I've treated dogs, cats, horses, 
catch squirrels <laughs> effectively. It, it works remarkably on animals. But uh, yeah, that's a very interesting question. It would make very interesting research. It would be it would be interesting, you know, like even with this this uh, this IRS agent dude that you treated, you know, like he was he was loquacious and pacey and restless and I don't know how long his teeth had been sensitive, but that was probably part of his case a long time before he decided that he was going to swell his legs up. And so even right. though his right. immediate wife didn't have, he could have been in a less overtly uh, uh, pathological lack of state. You know, he could have been in a more superficial state or whatever with less pathology in the meat. So I, I would just be curious in his yeah. overall history. That's all. True. You know, and I've had other snake remedy cases. Like I had a, a gentleman who had um, lesions not quite as bad as this gentleman. Um, he had he had come back from South America from from traveling in the jungle. He was doing an ayahuasca trip down there, and he had skinned the top of his foot and developed a really bad staph strep infection that caused a wicked cellulitis of the left leg. All the way up to, I mean, he had a, a he also had a something lymphangitis and the red streak going up to the groin, mm -hmm. and almost septic, and he was in bad shape. And um, he, they put him on IV antibiotics and oral antibiotics, and the fever and the sepsis went away, but the leg was still swollen and nasty. And um, he 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 was slightly equacious. He had lachesis like symptoms, and I initially gave him a dose of lachesis uh, because of the swelling and it was purplish and the rest of it. And it didn't touch the case. And I said, hmm. So I asked more questions. And I said, what does it feel like when you first get out of bed? And he said, oh, my God, when I first swing my legs out of bed in the morning, and I try to, it, my leg feels like it's going to burst. It's so incredibly painful, like almost break into tears. And that I immediately changed the remedy to Viperatorva. Which, and Vipera has that symptom, sensation as if the leg will burst as, um, as, the, leg, as the leg hands down. And after one M, one M dose, that's all I needed to give him. Within a few days, the cellulitis was completely gone and the pain was gone. And he said, as as soon as the dose touched his tongue, he felt as, some, as if somebody put a pin into his leg and, and like it popped like a balloon and, and it had a sensation of it deflating, even though it, it the, at the swelling hadn't changed yet. So that almost on a metaphysical level, it, there was an effect and then it gradually healed. So it's interesting that the you know the, we have to look at the other snake remedies uh, when when lachesis doesn't work. Totally so, totally so. Great case. Thank you for that wonderful case. Both all of your ones that you talked about. Sure. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Doctor Farouk Master has a book, a whole book on snakes. I mean, all different types of snakes. I'm sure you're familiar with that niche. Uh, yeah, he he gave me a copy. It's well, really good. It's yeah. really good. Yeah. yeah, they they have a lot more snakes there than we have here. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, in India. <laughs> He's in Mumbai, right? Yeah. <laughs> I see one of the, one of the remedies I see, actually quite common, uh, can, uh, next to lachesis is Quillis horridus, and I've had two cases of uh, Quillis cascavella that were quite interesting. When they have really, they have really, really bizarre spiritual, emotional symptoms as well. But yeah, they're, they're, they're incredible remedies if you know how to use them. Kim Malia has a seminar on that. <laughs> yeah, uh, Francine said that uh, Kim Malia has a seminar on, on snakes. Yeah, it's a, it's a good one. And I know I had a student. Uh, when I was when I was teaching homeopathy at, at NUHS, or we're having this session, um, we had a student that had a case that responded really well at Fertilis Cascavella. It was either dreams or delusions about uh, black skeletons. And that's one of the dreams or delusions of Fertilis Cascavella. And it, it, the patient responded very well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something about dark or black skeletons. So. Or, or any kind of dreams of, th of like evil things that could be them too of all kinds of images it's interesting how these it's, it's all venoms and the venoms i'm sure have similar some similarities but obviously each species of venom is slightly different and it creates a different uh, you know proving profile yeah, yeah. 
uh, at the at the recent uh, NCH meeting where where the uh, movie uh, introducing homeopathy was um, introduced, uh, Kim gave a very good case of uh, oh, that. Yeah. But there, there was Bothrops, Lanceolatus, that was a really good case. That though it, it, most people guessed was Lachesis. And there was a slight little tweaks and, and that remedy came out very strongly. It reacted beautifully. Interesting. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Well, if there's no other questions, how about a round of applause for that excellent lecture from Dr. Fleischer? Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure, guys. While Tim is helping us kind of transfer over the computer to our next speaker, let me just introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Lisa Greenan. And um, you'll remember that she gave us an excellent update, was it last March, I think, about the FDA uh, regulations and things coming down the pike uh, regarding homeopathy. That was wonderful. And uh, so today, um, she's going to be speaking to us as well. Uh, remember that uh, Dr. Lisa has studied with Dr. Richard Pitcairn, and she practices at Mercy Vet uh, Clinic on Mercer Island, Washington. And she will be speaking to us on a case presentation and discussion of juvenile cellulitis in animals. Let's go right into it. So Lisa Brennan is the presenter, Bob. Bob? Lisa Brennan? Yes. Lisa, are you there? Yeah. Can, am I unmuted? Oh, yay. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Let me. Let me you need to put out. it in presenter mode. Yeah. And maybe oh. you put your, if you want to put your webcam on, actually, Mitch had it on the whole time. It was pretty good. Yeah. Let me see how to do that. I want, I didn't do it right last time. So it's right on the control panel, should be on the right side. It looks like a little camera, like a little box with a little triangle on it. If you click that, it'll say share webcam. Here, I'll, I'll just do it here. Oh, I clicked I, it. And there's mine. I clicked it. It's, it turns green. It's okay. otherwise it's grayed out. Can you see my screen yet? Yeah, I see your screen. Okay. Um, you see the little control panel with the orange uh, arrow to the left? Oh, yeah. Uh, if you oh. go down the first, oh. second, third button is a little camera that's grayed out. Click on that. It'll also be on the top oh. of your. Yeah. Okay. There you go. You can see me now. Okay. And then if you could put your presentation in the presentation mode. Let's see. You click one of the buttons somewhere. I know. I need to go. I, I here. It's on the upper right hand side of the. It's in purple. There you go. There we go. Perfect. Can you still see my picture though? Because I can't. Yeah, yeah, you won't likely be able to, Lisa, but our okay. screens will show it. Can you hear me fine? Yeah, we hear you good. We hear you and we see you. Okay, good. All right. So um, for the veterinarians in this group, at least before we were trained in homeopathy, and maybe even then, seeing a case of juvenile cellulitis, often called puppy strangles, can strike a bit of fear into you because um, Untreated, there's acute rapid progression of swelling, crusting, and then sloughing and scarring of the face. This condition also affects the body systemically, and it's thought to be an extreme um, immune-mediated inflammatory process that attacks the skin, causes swelling of regional lymph nodes. Um, it produces hematological and dermatopathological um, changes, and I'll be presenting an anecdotal case of a seven-week-old male-neutered golden retriever puppy using homeopathic treatment with just a little bit of palliative topical care due to the extreme nature of this condition. 
And anyone who has uh, treated this condition either homeopathically or allopathically will know that um, this, the topical treatments that I did would not be sufficient to resolve this case without some other intervention, whether it's homeopathic or allopathic. And um, when I first started this, this case, the owner categorically declined immunosuppression. She'd had a bad experience with steroids in another one of her golden retrievers, and she did not want to use any, um, any steroids. And so this actually left me free to use homeopathic medicine um, with the support of the client, especially in the first couple of days, um, the puppy was looking worse. So I was walking through, just through the reception area, and I glanced from across the room at the picture that the client had sent. And I could, I looked at that and it was of course, I think a Friday at four o'clock or something. And I went, oh no, I could see across the room that this puppy um, probably had puppy strangles. I almost didn't even need to do any diagnostics to know that. And so I got the puppy in, seven week male, um, Oh, it, intact male golden retriever, uh, average, average weight uh, in dogs, a temperature of 101 is totally normal. Um, there were recrusted papules on the muzzle, ears, and tummy around the prepuce. Uh, the lips were thickened in edematous, and the submandibular lymph nodes were enlarged. He'd been seen five days prior by my colleague, and he just had a little minimal scab on his chin and we were just doing like a green tea compress figuring it would just go away and so three days later the muzzle was already very swollen it was progressing quickly um, so i did some diagnostic work i did a um, cbc uh, there was anemia and a mildly elevated lymphocyte count and so we're starting day one and things don't look horrible here uh, and so we caught it kind of early. So a lot of people, when they look at pictures of puppy strangles online, they'll see these horrible pictures of puppies' faces raw and sloughing. And this puppy didn't look too bad, but I also knew to check for the other areas that are affected. So we we're just starting around the groin and the ears. And sometimes um, in some of these cases, the ears are terribly affected. And so they're treating these what they think is just a regular ear infection. And I just used the Alden Time Micrep. I haven't gone to any of the new versions, although I have them. Um, I usually do Micrep 4.5 and Boninghausen and Kent. And then, I, and then I go and do my reading and primarily the first book I open up is Murphy's Materia Medica. And um, so in a puppy, I don't have a lot of other um, modalities they didn't they the they didn't have like personality traits or anything that's kind of a new puppy to them and um, I did a little what's called laser therapy it's photo biomodulation of the muzzle and chin just because I know this these cases can go really badly um, and I wanted to have a good chance to treat this patient without uh, drugs or allopathics. And my first prescription, um, I went ahead with Mer Mercurius um, and I used LM1 and we have modified the Hahnemann LM protocol from a half a cup to a quarter cup just because clients get so worried about wasting water for some reason. And I do, do um, depending on the strength of the patient, Ten, five or 10 succussions and 10 drops in a quarter cup water. I did a one mil um, from that glass, a uh, test dose, and then I follow, follow up in a few days. And then I was planning to do three times a week. And at the time we were ordering our um, remedies from Natural Health Supply. Um, the supportive supplements I used, there's a product called Vetri Science Cell Advance. It's also now called immune support, I think. And it's just multi, kind of a multivitamin with some minerals and um, some selenium and, and a few other antioxidants. It's not really like a high powered 
a supplement that would be considered necessarily medicinal. Um, I got the Peppy on a good quality fatty acid, Nordic natural product, and then I used some zeolites just to kind of detox him. Um, I did use a little bit of chlorhexidine foam every three days just on the face because I didn't want to get, I did not even want to get a secondary infection. Um, and then the, the laser treatment that we use is Light Cure Companion Laser is the company. And then just a little, I just in from Murphy's Materia Medica, um, I think Merck Viv or Merck Sol was very um, fitting. There's the dry scales, there's the moist vesicles break open, there's the, the crusting. Now, at this point, the pu it was still early in the case, so the puppy wasn't excoriated, but if, if anyone looks online at puppy strangles, they'll see this excoriated, bleeding, raw process on their face. Um, now, there there is separation that gets then dries into like a yellow brown crust and um, later on in this case this puppy did become um, itchy and then the, the face is swollen there's the pustules the corners of the mouth are ulcerated and the ears um, had inflammation and the glands were enlarged and then uh, this is a destructive process if left untreated and so I think um, was classing this as syphilitic miasm. And um, I just did a little bit of blood work. This is just the, the case. Um, so we can just see they're a little bit anemic. Um, there, there's a mild inflammatory response. I don't know what would happen if this were left because we caught them pretty early. So I, day one, I started the Merxol. The day three, the puppy is doing really great, energetic. Um, his face looks worse, and I have pictures of that. And then there, and then there's some more development of skin inflammation around the prepuce. And so I, the client has the worksheet on how to prepare the remedies, and I just do it the very classic Hahnemann way. And then um, our plan is just to frequently follow up. Like she emailed me very regularly. I saw the puppy very regularly, and she managed to order all the products to use on on this puppy. Do you think so, the nurse was an aggravation or just progression and hasn't quite slowed down yet? No, I think it was the I I didn't deem it as an aggravation. I just carried on with the the remedy. I think that this is a very fast paced disease. Um, which is why I, I often will do homeopathy because of our our standards of practice through the AVH. I often will try to do homeopathy just purely, maybe some supplements, but without a laser or chlorhexidine foam. But this is a fast-paced disease, and I think it was progression of disease, and and not that I had the wrong remedy. So I felt I felt fine, even though it looked worse. So um, the 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 face, you can, if we could pair them all side by side, the face is getting worse. But so I just went ahead and said, let's go every other day with the Merck salt. And then we use some vitamin E on a Q-tip just to kind of clean the crests in the ears. And then um, the also sometimes with skin disease, it will look worse. But then when things fall off, the skin looks better underneath and not terrible. So um, that was my opinion. It was just the progression of the disease. And, um, and, and he, his appetite's good, his energy is good. And um, I just plan to go ahead and, and see him. And some of these are her pictures and some are mine from the office call. So there he is. It's a little worse, but you can see the lip margin, the skin there um, is kind of a normal pink color. It doesn't look horrible under the crests. And um, and there's day eight. Look, it looks better already. So I mean, the ears look a little worse. And then you can see the crests are falling off around the prepuce. And I know some of these pictures aren't great, but it's hard to take up close pictures of a puppy. Um, but you can see it's looking better. So so day seven, there's signs of improvement. I 
Um, I had her give the other dose of Merxol. I planned on the exam. So day eight, the face and ears are improved and the crusting's falling off. There's normal looking skin underneath the chin. I would um, say from the beginning was healed about 70%, the tummy 20%. And, and so I felt uh, that he was stable and that some lesions were improved significantly. And I, um, I went ahead and did one more round of uh, the laser treatment and continue every other day. And then I wanted him, I wanted to have a good uh, gut flora. And because in these young puppies, their immune system's not really well developed. And so I like to support them with probiotics. Now, um, this starts to show me how truly, oh, um, how this disease affects the whole body. I mean, the blood work was changed, the skin was changed, but um, this picture below shows his paws, actually all his paws scaled up like that and, and sloughed a little bit. So that once again, I'm looking at how the puppy's feeling. It's doing great, appetite, energy, everything's good. Every, the skin continues to improve. Um, there was just one little spot on his nose. I don't have a picture of that, but his pots are worse. And I know this isn't like maybe the right direction, but I think his whole body was affected and I just didn't know notice that his paws were bad. I didn't notice to know to look at his paws. Um, they they peeled, but then they got better. And then we're into something where now he's looking pretty good um, on this more critical thing, but then he's itchy. And we fiddled around with the itchy puppy. We talked about food, um, getting rid of maybe chicken in the diet. Um, and so we were just working on, um, cause, cause that like here he had this serious autoimmune disease and now what's bothering them is watching their puppy itch. So we, we eventually got through that. I made sure he didn't have fleas. We stopped the chicken. I gave them ideas on food. Um, I just, my concept was that his, just his immune system was just, dysregulated, maybe a little over in, inflamed. Um, I still like to do my raw fermented goat milk with the probiotics, do my fish oil. We, um, we just, he's such a little puppy. We went kind of low on the, the multivitamin. I wanted him on a more digestible diet, but she just, I, it, um, I think I have it on the next one. She just chose whatever she'd used in her other dogs. And then I made sure he didn't have parasites and he had a negative fecal sample. So here we're at day 30. And they actually, I think they were even planning to keep this puppy of all things. Um, so they finally named him and um, they're feeding him the solid gold wolf cub food, which isn't exactly natural. I usually like either um, if, either uh, raw food or freeze dried food or slightly cooked food, but he seems to be doing okay. His digestion's better, um, he's still itchy, he has some discharge. So we're still kind of working on that. Um, we're still working on the ears and then they're kind of pushing me for his vaccines and I held, managed to hold off on that. His weight is fine and uh, normal fecal exam. And there he is. Day 30. So here he looks pretty normal. His his just it's interesting from these pictures because we we could judge it based on his fur, but he has like an energy, like you could almost see his energy is better and brighter. And so certainly his face looks better. I'm holding off on the vaccines. We're continuing probiotics, the zeolite. And now I'm just doing Merxol every three days. And here, day 50. So now we can see his hair coat in general looks really weird. Um, and, and so this just kind of shows how the puppy strangles is not just about his face and his lymph nodes. It affected all of his whole entire body. And, and so, um, we're, we're looking 
we're looking at his face looks good, but the hair on his ears looks really weird. This is a golden retriever. They usually have a lot longer hair. Um, we we use just a little bit of, I think we just used some Duluth calendula. We use some witch hazel to clean his ears. The itchiness is getting better. I just sort of stayed the course with, with the food and the remedy. And um, so then I want to go. So I'm okay with other dogs visiting him. And I'm okay, we're gonna do one distemper parvo and I'm just like praying that it doesn't stir everything up. But um, I, I'm keeping him on all his supplements and then I'm keeping him on the twice a week Merxol. And then, um, and then I kind of fast forward clear into day 81. He'd been off Merxol. He was basically healed. He did fine with the distemper parvo. And, and we did a rabies vaccine several months later. And, and then usually at our clinic, they get those basic vaccines like the distemper parvo. And then we don't ever do that one ever again their whole life. And then the rabies vaccine, we try to be very conservative about that. But there are certain laws and licensing things around here so this is what he looked at like so this is what he looks like at um several months later fully grown so he looks good there and um so i'm just going to talk about juvenile cellulitis so we don't really know what triggers it and, it and it can't necessarily be vaccination because a lot of these puppies they're so young when they present with it they're not even vaccinated yet um, so we, we know that it's some kind of um, immune dysregulation or immune attack because the allopathic um, treatment is immunosuppressive doses of glucocorticoids, whether it's prednisone or dexamethasone. Um, now, any, I, I've seen this in a variety of breeds. Any breed can develop this disease, but it is common in the Golden Retrievers, Gordon Setter, Brittany Spaniel, and Dachshund, and puppies three weeks to four months old. Um, I have never seen this in an older dog. It's usually a puppy thing. And um, this, may, this information I've got from an article in Veterinary Information Network. Why is it called puppy strangles? Does it actually lead to suffocation? I Maybe think it's it, because of obstruction or something. I think it could, but there's like a uh, like equine strangles too, and it's like I think it has to do with draining lymph nodes. That's a really good. I'll look that up. That's a really good thing. I think there's something where there's like draining lymph nodes, and that's like an olden time word. And Lisa, that's this, why they did it. It that's why they did it because it it mirrored the uh, horse strangles and horse strangles doesn't always have the lift nodes the drain, but, oh. but they, mirrored the, they mirrored the name of, of puppy strangles. I that. figured that, but is strangles like an old time word for what, what? That it... Cervical limb adenopathy that can be like massive? Maybe. <laughs> I will look up, I will look that up because that's very interesting. Um, so the standard physical exam, they usually all have this facial swelling um, and and the, all around the eyelids, the lips, nose, muzzle, um, they can have bad, sometimes people just focus on the ears um, with the di thick discharge, custody lesions, and then also it can affect um, around the bo bottom, the prepuce and inguinal area. Um, there's usually marked submandibular lymphadenopathy and other peripheral lymph nodes um, may be enlarged. I didn't notice that in this case, and I was looking. Um, there's a rapid onset that you've got these papules and pustules, they rupture, um, they can be purulent or bloody, and they can get very crusty, and they can be very painful, although I caught this case pretty early, although it was gone going pretty fast. Um, I haven't seen, usually when I notice it, it's just on the, the face, but um, they can have other nodules um, and 50% of the puppies develop lethargy and anorexia and fever, lameness and joint pain. 
Um, so it does affect the whole body, I think is the point. And then on the uh, blood work, they can have leukocytosis, neutrophilia, um, neuromacidic, neurochromic anemia. So I saw the anemia. Um, and then it's interesting because you do the cytology and there's no microorganisms. There's no bacteria or yeast. These are sterile, um, but there can be secondary bacterial infection and um, the, the lesions, um, once they fistulated and ulcerated, I can see, I was trying to prevent um, secondary bacteria in this puppy so that we didn't, so that he could heal well and not have any um, uh, scarring because then I have to see the puppy for the rest of his life and I wanted him to look great. Um, so, I didn't go ahead because I, I didn't go ahead and do any deep skin scrapings to rule out Demodex um, because I wasn't going to immunosuppress these puppies. But I think that would be something to consider because if you're going to immunosuppress a puppy and this is actually Demodex, that will not go well. Um, so it's a sterile disease and um, bacterial and fungal cultures are negative. Skin biopsies, um, which I didn't do, I didn't. I mean, this is looks, there's really not a lot that looks like it. Um, skin biopsies and histopath can provide a definitive diagnosis um, and rule out other causes, which I think if you're going to immunosuppress severely, um, a puppy you may want to do that. Um, it's a deep pyogranulomatous dermatitis and um, paniculitis. And unless secondary pyoderm is present, infectious organisms are absent. Um, and, and then also, if you wait long enough, there will be scarring and fibrosis. So, so this, this is what veterinarians typically do. The allopathic treatment of choice is glucocorticoids at immunosuppressive doses. Um, it, I guess if it doesn't, if prednisone doesn't work, or do, I would actually, if I, I wasn't going to, immunosuppressant, but if I had used something, dexamethasone has fewer side effects, less P, um, PUPD. I can't really even imagine using cyclosporin on a puppy. Um, now, until clinical signs resolve, two to four weeks, and then you're supposed to treat in an additional seven days. Um, and then you do supportive therapy. Uh, that Usually, these puppies have terrible ear infections, so the ears are treated. They're often on antibiotics. Um, that they can have some soaks. I I did use a little bit of foam every three days on the face, the chlorhexidine foam, to prevent secondary bacterial infections. And then we didn't need to do anything much with the ears besides that vitamin E oil on a Q-tip and then a little witch hazel to clean later. And then um, monitoring, obviously, if these dogs are on immunosuppressive drugs, um, they need to to be treated, treated and monitored for adverse events. And then even, even once they're immunosuppressed, the prognosis is good for complete recovery. And if treatment's delayed, they're going to have alopecic scarring. Um, the dogs with paniculitis would need longer treatment times. And um, the, cyclos the reason people would shift to cyclosporin is just on immunosuppressive doses of steroids, they're peeing all over the place. And these are puppies and they're already not that well potty trained. So I'm sure that's a nightmare for clients with their poor puppy. Um, and then relapses if, they're, if therapy stops too soon. And, um, and then there's this study of 90 adult dogs. The treatment time was basically 60 days. Um, and then there were ex recurrences and so my, my basically the wonderful takeaway from homeopathy is for starters, I didn't take a seven week old dog and immunosuppress them and immunosuppress this dog. So he has a, I can look to him and know that he's going to have a good immune system. I was built, working to help him build his immune system and he can grow normally and, um, so it's very gratifying. And, and he responded pretty quickly. And it was only a little scary in the first five days. And I went, oh my gosh, I hope this puppy doesn't scar. So 
that's that's the case of this guy. And I saw him actually about six months ago, and he still looks good. Oh, this disease, even if you immunosuppress them, once they're adults, it doesn't come back. So there's probably more to learn with, with that, but it's probably just their immune system is so developing when they're puppies too. Okay. This is Magnus. Lisa, I have a, a um, maybe a comment and a question. First of all, uh, um, the face got better and like the trunk got better, but the the uh, uh, palm uh, the paws were were scaling. To me, that seems like it's following the direction of, of cure. So that's the good sign. And on humans, when I see that the face rash is getting better and it's moving down the extremities to the hands and feet, that's a good sign. That means oh. you're here. Okay, and that's good. That the case here, it seems. Is yeah. that why the animals do? I I get I guess that is. I mean, sometimes I I may. With that, I couldn't comment so much on the feet because it might have been happening when I first saw him. I just wasn't looking at his pad. Got it. Okay, but, so mine okay. but she noticed, and I went, oh, wow. It just was letting me know how systemic this disease is. It's not just fo focalized to the skin or to the head. It's like, oh, my goodness. So, like, his whole body. And then the fur, I was really surprised to see how the um like his whole body hair coat was affected but then it but then it got better just over time but it seems like that was a good direction you you didn't see it till later but even if it was there at the beginning the fact that the feet were still there a bit in terms of scaling but the face and the prejuice and everything other things that it improved sounds sounds like a good direction the other yeah. comment I have is I've treated a few cases of cellulitis and I know what you mean they're rapidly progressive sometimes you have in humans, because they don't have hair, we can draw a circle around where the redness goes to, and it can progress by the hour, certainly half a day or day. Um, I found in those cases, I need to use remedies like every hour or two. Uh, I was just commenting about your, uh, I wonder what you think about, you were giving the uh, Merxol uh, LM1 every other day. I mean, have you thought about giving it more often? Because on the third day, it was actually looking worse. I know in a, in a human, if they have cellulitis and we give them a remedy for three days and it's getting worse, we lose the patient. They're on IV antibiotics, they're in the hospital. So it's like, if we don't find a remedy that in a case like that, I'm like checking in with them twice a day to make sure that things are slowing down, you know, and, and starting to reverse and giving the remedy really often. So if you want to comment on that. Yeah, I guess because he was eating and playful and is vital like his energy was good and it wasn't i i will give a remedy more frequently and um i just didn't it seemed like he was doing well from an energy eating standpoint if he were laying around i probably would have given it more frequently and i do i do know what you mean um i also i have okay so my training was with is has been with Richard Pitcairn and we give a remedy, like a high, high potency remedy. And so I have this training where we'd wait a lot. We're like the um, Kent training. You give a remedy and you wait a very long time. And so over the course of my practice, I me giving a remedy um, every day is really a lot to me, but I, I get it. I, I wasn't gonna lose this case. I. No, the, I case did really, the case did really well. And it's interesting, Kent came up with that type of prescribing, but he really could, he didn't treat successful cancer patients and patients with like more serious diseases. He couldn't treat them. And part I, of the problem I with this pathology, I mean, have, having worked with uh, Dr. Sane, I mean, sometimes he'll give, uh, you know, a 10M, uh, a high uh, H potency even every hour or two. And yeah. in a serious case, like a cancer case with pain, with pain or something, it's like, you have to match the pathology to the aggressiveness of the disease. And I find when I do that, it, things turn out well. And Kent, I think, kind of, you know, had this, again, I think he mixed a bit sweet organism with, with, with homeopathy, and it kind of led to this, you know, kind of mystical whatever that, you know, he kind of overemphasized the mental symptoms 
And like, if the person's dying of cancer, you can't, you know, you can't do that. You have to meet the disease where it, where it's at. And if it's aggressive, you got to be aggressive with the facade. I, I agree with you. And I actually been a patient of Dr. Sain for probably eight or nine years. So I learned a lot from him taking 10 impotencies more, way more frequently, but it's like myself. So it's like, I can, it's like, oh, it's myself. So if I have an aggravation, I could be more in control of it. But um, yeah, so because of Dr. Sain, I do give remedies more frequently. And um, I, but, but the veterinarians from ABH in this group, they know our training was initially like that. So we've branched out a lot to do more frequent dosing, playing around with um, lower potencies and more frequently. So it's just an evolution of my, my practice. But I do like LMs because I feel like I can give those a lot, very frequently. And I would have increased if the puppy was not energetic eating and seeming improved on a deeper, deep level. Hey Lisa, just, just, to, just to add to that, I, I just, well, I've said this before, but you know, our original training um, was actually not sixth organ on training. And I think that that, that's a big gap actually. I in know. A lot of the veterinary, you know, a lot of the veterinary training. And so, um, and and as brilliant a clinician and as an experienced uh, homeopath and and homeopathic scholar as Richard is, he is really, really, really dug in about you know not giving uh, remedies in mm -hmm. in liquid and and I think that that puts a lot of us at a disadvantage because uh, to 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 suggest that we might be able to do that and indeed might be able to. Um, prescribe more frequently than the dry watch and wait sort of method that that we've been trained in we generally over the years um you know it it there's a lot of folks who have taken a lot of pushback for that i mean you know because because of uh about about the, st the stubbornness of richard who is a is a really admired mentor and he just can't yeah. see his way clear to do six organ on prescribing generally and you know i don't say that as a criticism to any of your work or 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 anything but it is really a hard thing to change your mind when when you get such pushback from from a clinician who probably was your introduction to veterinary homeopathy and and um um you know as I say, he's he's very rigid in in those things, and he pushes back about against that pretty aggressively. Yeah, well, well, Richard, Richard was many of ours and my very first mentor, and I still thank him always for the very classical training that I received. We did really. Kent was a main a main study guide. I still grab Kent to to look at my remedies, and but over time, I do. I don't do any dry dosing at all anymore. Yeah, I think so here. I, I give, I, I have um, clients dissolve the potency, whatever I choose in water. And um, we will give maybe a couple times a day or daily for a few days, see how things go. And I do, I have cha broken out of that model a bit. And then, but the LMs I still do per, for Hahnemann with the succussions and the drops. And I know that some people are doing like, they put it in these water glasses and then you've got like five water glasses and then you're dosing from this other. And I still just find for veterinary patients and clients, they can't do a lot of complex. I, I mean, I maybe I'm underrating them, but they just won't do a lot of complex stuff. So LMs with the 10 succussions, 10 drops, two or three times a week or, or daily, that's about where we are with it. But they can email me. I On cases like this, they can email me, call me, text me. I mean, I just, you know, I have a handful of cases where um, I'm not worried that I've sent them off to do something and they can't reach me and then they have to go to the ER. I, I avoid that. So I would, I would have dosed him or changed something if if things hadn't been going well. 
I think part of the confusion, even stemming from Hahnemann, because Hahnemann, in the, in the sixth edition of the Organon, the LM potencies, he considered if he put it in water and was giving it multiple times a day from the same glass, he would consider that one dose. And I think that's why people yes. that's use right. oh, it's one dose, but he's like giving it multiple times a day. And uh, I think what you're saying about Richard, I think in, the, in, in human homeopathy, I think uh, the Tolkas was very influenced by uh, Kant as well. And uh, he taught for a long time, oh yeah, one dose, and we a long time to arrive. And I've, I've seen in his writings just recently, he's talking about, oh, now yeah, you have to actually give the remedy more often. So, uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, Hahnemann was great. You know, the people right after Hahnemann, Denninghouse, and Lee Day, and I think Kant kind of took homeopathy and kind of did some thing with it and kind of made it a little more spiritual or something like that. And kind of, uh, yeah, I. I don't use him very much as a primary source. And some of his remedies in his material medica, the synthetic remedies, which he didn't even prove, he just, like, if you look at calcarea silicata, he just took the, the proving of calc, calc and silica and combined them. And you can tell those synthetic, uh, oh. uh, he was criticized for it and he stopped publishing them after that. You can see it, you can, you can, you know, you have a synthetic uh, 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 material medica remedy when he says, oh, it's worse in the four. Morning, early morning, late morning, forenoon, noon, early yeah. afternoon, late afternoon, evening, before midnight, midnight, and after. It's like, it's like, what, what's characteristic about that? It's where it's all the time. It's like, because he just combined the two remedies and made that into proven. So, yeah, he, he did some things that are, are the old homeopaths, uh, the Anamanian homeopaths criticized him for, and he stopped doing it. And unfortunately, I think a lot of people depend on him for their for their teaching. And you know, again, you can be a bit led astray by some of this stuff. I, I think it's just stuff. go to Murphy. I just go to Murphy's as my materia medica and do a lot of reading there. But I just I to be honest, with veterinary with my veterinary patients, I do a lot of polycrests, and so I'm not doing very few small remedies unless I'm really having coming up against a hard case so i think to your point about the differences in how clinicians prescribe in the homeopathic community we can certainly get you know stuck in the weeds about and and you know i'll be the first one to admit i'm far in the weeds most of the time but but i also think that it makes sense to also think that there are uh, there's not that many homeopaths out there and there's a lot of stuff out there that gets called homeopathy that is not homeopathy. And I, you know, I, I did a four year masters in, in um, human homeopathy with a, a Votukian homeopath. And, and uh, you know, I'm not probably going to step into the ditch with this person or with Richard or, or with anybody and, you know, and, fight, fight, fight with them about, about their prescribing other than, you know, sometimes we can find case, cases that might have worked more smoothly or whatever, or, or that the case might be lost because there was such a strong aggravation from the dry dosing that the patient decided they weren't going to return to, to care or whatever. Uh, but I, I also think that, you know, like, I hate to say like that minor thing between the fourth and the sixth organon um, uh, aside, but I, I I really do think that we really need to promote a lot more good good solid capital H, you know, Hahnemannian classical type homeopathy, and and I know your group has talked about that um, because I think there's a lot, a lot, a lot of really bizarre side trails that people can go down that that you know get called superficially homeopathy that sure as heck aren't or misunderstanding. Uh, you know, uh, I spent some time this summer with some people that you know, oh, we're a big homeopathy family and we've always done it and blah 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 and none of the, you know none of the there wasn't a a potentized medicine in the building, much less a potentized proven remedy in the building. So, and I, you know, so I don't, I don't mean to, to disparage my colleagues, but I think that 
that that's part of the situation that we see in in the veterinary world, Lisa, and, and the rest of the group with our historical training. It's interesting having worked with uh, and, and like you, Lisa, being a patient of Dr. Sainz, but also having studied with him for 20 years, it's interesting seeing the evolution of his own pathology that when he has class and such. Totally. Uh, it's interesting. I studied with Dr. Desiaga. Uh, he was a urologist from Buenos Aires. He did homeopathy. He taught here quite a few years and uh, eventually passed away. But he would always start with low potency six and then 12 and then 30. And he was treating people with lots of pathology. And uh, Andre, I know when I first started with him, he'd always almost start with a 200 and go up from there. And some people would get that experience. I'm sure everyone's had that experience. Now, it's interesting when he has his uh, uh, case studies, we'll take a case online and students are there and then two days later you come together and he tells you what he gave and you tell what you think it needs to be. His pathology has really changed. He tends to start, and he's treating people with serious pathology, cancers, multiple myeloma, you know, serious stuff. And he's starting with lower potencies, uh, gradually increasing and then going to high potencies, just like Dr. Esiaga. So it's, you know, it's like the pathology thing is an interesting thing and sure, uh, the issue with maybe the Kenji, you start with a 10 M and something, and I have patients that unless you give them a 10 M, nothing happens. But you can't look at a patient and know they're going to be like that. So it's there's something too, like starting low and gradually increasing. Because if you give a patient who's sensitive a 10 M and they have a bad iteration and they end up in the ER, you've lost the patient. And then homeopathy gets a bad name. And you probably could have helped the person if you'd have been more attentive and gradual. So, no, I understand being sensitive, you know, you have to, pathology is kind of something that, you know, students always want to know, oh, what potency and stuff. It's like, you, you have to individualize to the patient. Every patient, you have to do oh, yeah. something different and you have to adjust to the patient. You know? Well, and they it call it a test. Quickly. They call it a test dose for a reason, right? <laughs> Exactly. And, and like Mitch, you know, like Mitch says, your remedy can read just beautifully, but we don't know anything about that until we actually give it to the patient, right? So it's a test dose on our study, and it's a test dose on on the potency, and it's a test dose on the dry versus the wet, or versus the first cup versus the fifth cup. It's all, you know, it it's really we just don't know. So, I, I don't very often do just the te test dose. I usually just jump right in with the LMs um, because I because I'm not giving them daily. They kind of have a chance because I'll have clients that go, "Oh, it's time for the next dose, and this is what happened." And I go, "Oh, okay, hold on, let's wait, let's wait a little longer," and then I I get a chance um, to not mess up the case because I've repeated the remedy too often. Luckily, with human homeopathy, we can ask the patient about their sensitivity. Maybe with an animal, we can't do that. You just have a report maybe from the, from the, from the yeah. animal but, owner. But in humans, we can say, well, are you allergic? Are you sensitive? You know, and sometimes I'll give people the choice. Well, we could start with a big dose or a little. And then, no, give me the little. I think I'm, you know, and usually patients are right. Um, so in humans, we have some some advantage there. But, you know, still sometimes you make, you know, you, know, you misfire for sure with the pathology. And you always think about, you know, where where are they most likely to aggravate too? Yep. Well, that's an interesting one because I have a lot of patients where I'm giving belladonna for some other reason than like what I'm gonna tell them. And I have a lot of belladonna patients where I have an or, or ear hematoma. And if I just go, let's get this done and give a 200 C, they'll get diarrhea. And I've had that happen I had like a behavioral case where Bellatana was perfect. And luckily when they got raging diarrhea, that sorted, they didn't suppress it. And then the behavior was much better. But so there's certain remedies where it's like, I know I'm going to get a big problem. Actually, my dad had a situation where he was starting to get a tooth abscess and he was totally belt, like his face was shiny red and hot. And I gave a dose of Belladonna and then he had to urinate a whole bunch and and this was like in a care a home care situation with him because he wasn't doing well. But my mom's like, did the Belladonna do that? And I go, uh, no, no, not at all. And then later I go, yeah, discharge, right? yeah. <laughs> well, because then that by that night the the abscess 
ruptured, the pain was much better. He felt tremendously better, but he, and this was hard because he was somewhat, oh, I don't remember. He wasn't bed bound yet, but it was like, oh, he's got to pee a whole bunch, like every 15 minutes. And so now I know that Belladonna can also cause that because I talked to another homeopath and he said that happened. Like he wanted that to happen. His mother couldn't urinate. They were going to do some kind of procedure. And so he snuck her a little dose of belladonna while she was in the hospital and then she urinated and everything was all good. So these, these remedies, if you go too high, you're going to get something where they're going to wind up going to ER or something. So I appreciate the conversation. Sometimes a discharge is a good sign. I mean, yeah. a few people in my comas and you give them opium and they maybe vomit and then they're constipation, they have diarrhea, you know, they evacuate from both ends, but then they wake up. So it's almost like you, once you stimulate the bottle force, yeah. and it's a reaction, that's like, but they're alive, you know, it's like, it's, 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 it's helping them. That's, it's almost like that's what they need. They need to expel those things to, to get to the and next I'll, level. So, you, you know, I, so I agree. You just that. have to prep them so that they don't go yeah. raging off to an ER for massive diarrhea and then get drugs, yeah. which screws up your case. And and all those symptoms, all those urinary symptoms, uh, are are within the belladonna remedy too. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the the question is, are you know, is it a discharge per se the way we think about in the positive, you know? like you just described, you know, have a big vomit and feel better or have a big poop and all of a sudden you feel better and like not just feel better, but the, the totality of the case shifts. Or is it a medicinal aggravation because of, of potency selection and dosing and, you know, you gave him 10 drops and really all he needed was one drop or, you know, all of that sort of yeah. stuff. Too. I just gave a 30C, just a single dry, dry dose. Actually, that was the easiest. Um, but it was really interesting because my mom goes, I was going to go look at your book, which is my Murphy's Materia Medica, which I travel with. And I was in Idaho with it. And she's like, I was going to go look in your book because I knew the urination was from the remedy. <laughs> but he turned out he seemed so much better that night with the pain. <laughs> I, I found that some patients are just so sensitive. No matter what you do, they'll aggravate. But that's not necessarily a bad sign for them. So if they aggravate and improve, then it's a good sign. I have one patient, she's so sensitive. I just do a 6C in water, and I don't do the multiple cups anymore. I do Andre's method of doing a toothpick. You do a toothpick, yeah. oh, yeah. you wipe it five times, 10 times, 15 times, 20, and touch it to the big toenail for just a second. And she'll aggravate for like days on that. So with a 6C in water, wipe the toothpick. So, but then it's a good remedy with after, it's almost like any remedy that she's sensitive to, she'll aggravate, but then if it's a good remedy, there'll be improvement. It's like, oh, now then I could start to feel yeah. better. I've been treating my dad for probably 20, oh, 25 years, I think. So <laughs> I know what his sensitivity level is, but I, I, when I first started with Sandre, the whole toothpick thing was like, oh, okay. But I'm not that sensitive, so I just like take a little few drops now. I left the toothpick behind. <laughs> the toothpick is very useful for some patients, I find. Instead, I used to do the multiple cups, but you're right. Most people that can't handle the multiple cups, it's like too yeah. much. And the toothpick is so much better. It's just a matter of just one cup, whatever amount of water, however much you stir it, however many pellets, and then a toothpick, and then how much do you wipe it, and how distal you put it on the tip of the tongue, on the shoulder, on the back of the hand, on the toenail, you know, that I I find that is it's it, it works. It works for really, really sensitive yeah, people. Interesting. I don't use that for many of my patients, but I got to try it myself, just for, out of interest of Dr. Sain's uh, toothpick remedy. <laughs> Uh, Francine was asking about olfaction. Andre doesn't like to use that much anymore. He says because a lot of people have congestion, nasal congestion, so it's hard to get a, a like a, you know, one time they'll get a big dose, sometimes they won't. So, well, he used to open up the tube for like five seconds with the person 20 feet away and then yeah. closed it. Yeah. He, did it he, had, he was at a, he did a seminar, at, I think it was at NTJAHC, where he did a talk about that. And then as the person got, it was for Parkinson's, 
Right. It was a Parkinson's where the person was so sensitive, he opens up the, the tube with the remedy for five seconds at 20 feet away. And then little by little, the person got closer and the tube was open longer yeah. before he actually even gave a physical dose. So yeah. did he replace that with the with The, the two take large, I think maybe still have some patients like that, but mainly two things. I have patients, I've had patients that can't even open the tube. They just hold the tube in their hand and yeah. with the right remedy, they get a reaction. And I didn't believe it at first, but then I had a patient, she had pneumonia and, and she had held a bunch of the remedies and she doesn't even open the tube, it's a blue tube. She just holds it in her hand. It didn't do anything. And I said, oh, you need phosphorus. You know, she had all the yeah. desires, ice cold water, uh, right-sided pneumonia, whatever, like bloody sputum, whatever. And, uh, she held the phosphorus in her hand, a 30C or 6C. She felt an electric shock go up her arm and immediately she started feeling better without even opening the tube. So, yeah. And I know that yeah, I've had those experiences stuff with the thyroxine that uh, even with a closed tube, it's like a ra radiation effect. Whatever the remedy is, there's some radiation there. And if you're sensitive to it, you, you, you pick it up without even touching, physically touching the tube or even being next to it. Well, here the cases that we have where we take a phone consult or an email consult, we decide on a remedy, and then the client like emails going, "Oh, my pet's better already. You haven't even sent the remedy or even told them what it is." And then it's like, "Oh, I know what the. I guess this is the right remedy. They're already better. I haven't even mailed it yet." Wow. <laughs> yeah. We have that happen in veterinary medicine. It just like. Or I tell them what to get, and then they don't get it right away, and then their pet's already getting better. That's so interesting. The process of, of listening and then the intention to help and something like that, and they, and they get better. Yeah, that could be it too. Any other questions for Dr. Lisa? online in person uh i see Lisa, i see nothing yeah. online nothing nothing online okay um great case by the way i think you really intervened early that was just fantastic I have one question for oh francine has one more question yeah. do you notice that they, uh, i don't know if you know were any of the other puppies that were in that litter presented or do you not know I can't. I can't hear you on the. Uh, she said, "Were there any other puppies in in that dog's litter affected?" With I don't the think so. Numbers? I don't think so because this client would have told me. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. And I guess we'll be wrapping it up for another month here. Uh, don't forget, next month it's going to be Saturday, October nineteenth is our next meeting. Uh, we're going to have two um, sort of shorter lectures and then one longer lecture. Uh, Dr. Janice Jurgs is going to be giving us a case presentation or two. And then uh, one of the naturopathic students, Kalia Duval, um, who has a lot of midwife um, uh, experience, and um, she's going to give us kind of an introductory um, uh, talk on obstetric homeopathy, which should really be good. Thanks to Lisa telling us about that. And then Dr. Eliza Katz will be giving us the DVM lecture as well. So until then, be safe and be healthy, and thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.